All right, colleagues and uh, students, it's time for further celebration. Um, coming minutes, hour, we're going to put colleagues in the spotlight because they deserve it, because we find it important and because they signify the core business of what we do, trying to help young people, as I said this morning, reaching the next level, enjoying that period, developing themselves, growing as a person and growing in that discipline or disciplines. And it's great to see so many colleagues here in the front, in the spotlights, although I realize that spotlights are me, but spotlights are meant for you, um, who have been working the last year under difficult circumstances and luckily last month not so difficult circumstances, helping our students, teaching, being uh, busy with, uh, with disciplines and, and the stuff that our students need to master. So I would like to do first is a selfie <laughs> on somebody else's telephone. I'm not sure whether that's a selfie, but anyhow, with you all uh, in the audience. So if you could please either smile, <laughs> jump, whatever. I try and make some pictures. Yeah, go ahead. One more. <laughs> All right, done. Okay. We have a number of um, awards that we will uh, hand out and share, but I'd like to emphasize that um, sure, we will nominate uh, or, or declare um, lecturer teacher of the year, but it's not about winning. It's about being here in the front row. It's about being recognized for what you did for us, for the university, and especially for our students. And it's great to see that so many people um, are active uh, and are recognized by our students as great teachers, helping them. Um, out of each faculty, uh, one is nominated. They're sitting here partly. There's also team members for the team prize that we have the team award. Um, but within your faculty, you are recognized as being a lecturer of uh, the year. And it means that there are also there people nominated. So it's, it's a lot of people and you take the credits, rightfully so, you take the spotlights, but you do that also, I guess, on behalf of all other people involved in lecturing and teaching, because it's a very important part of what we do. So let us start with the lecturer of the year. And um, that prize is given by, via our students, organized by the Student Association, Student Association Council, or in Dutch, the Studentenverenigingraad, SVR. And for that, to doing that, I would like to invite Robert van Dijk. Robert, the floor is yours. So let's talk a bit about the Lecture of the Year Award 2022 of the TU Delft. So near the end of last academic year, all the study associations organized their own um, Lecture of the Year Award for their own faculty. And uh, many of them had some amazing categories like the most innovative, the most uh, inspiring, the most influential uh, lecturer or even the best online lecturer of that year. And many students uh, came, uh, came to vote uh, on the lecture who they think stood out in those categories. So they voted for, the, for their favorite, their, uh, the most fun, the, uh, the lecturer who had the most personal connection with them, the most engaging lecturers, the lecturers with the best courses, or just the lecturers that uh, gave off the best vibe. And um, from all those lecturers, those amazing lecturers, every faculty could uh, nominate one uh, for the, well, the lecturer of the year of the TU Delft. And those eight lecturers are sitting here in front of me right now. So if you eight could stand up, we can give you a proper round of applause. Yeah, woo! We have, uh, we have a little something for you. So yeah. They are getting a beautiful envelope now. 
En uh, are, are the flowers? Ja. Yeah. They're all getting some beautiful flowers. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I don't know what's in the envelopes. Maybe it's one of those uh, little packets of flower food that you usually get for your bouquet. That would, of course, be very useful. Um, yeah, so let's give them one more round of applause. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah, you can sit back down again. Great. Okay, uh, and then, of course, uh, the TU Delft can nominate only one of these uh, lecturers for the docent van het jaar verkiezing, the lecture of the year of the Netherlands. And to decide who that would be, uh, the jury consisting of uh, Rob, uh, Anushka, uh, Tom uh, Bordini, the winner of the lecture of the year of last year, uh, Bart and Lena from the Central Student Council, and me, Robert, from the Study Association Council. We decided, we discussed and discussed, and we uh, finally decided who we th sh think uh, should go to the next round. Uh, yeah, so without further ado, let's look over all the lectures one more time and see who is going to the next round. Paul is a great motivator. He sparks a desire to learn by using styles references that connect to our frame of mind. During his courses, he demonstrates existing objects to teach us how to design better and to understand the inner mechanics through exploration. Tom is a very relatable lecturer. We feel a personal connection to him because he reveals the person behind the lecturer. Mathematics can seem like a rigid subject. But Tom's passion for his course motivates us to pass the exams and enjoy his lectures. Mark knows how to please the crowd. And he makes asking questions fun. He uses witty jokes to keep our attention and he checks for our understanding. He sparks our curiosity by explaining unsolved theories to show the opportunities for the future of science. Herre cares deeply about our personal and professional growth. He accepts and supervises not only the top students, but also those of us that struggle with physics. Rather than using mathematical reasoning, he encourages us to reason from our physical knowledge. You know it will be an interesting lecture when Jan enters the lecture room with his famous trolley filled with foam, wooden and steel models. His smile is well known by everyone and motivates us to keep up with the course and to tackle the difficult content. He's a great man, teaching hard stuff very easy. Alessandro is an exceptional storyteller. He translates computer science into real-life examples, relevant to industrial design engineering, which he converts into an interesting and easy-to-follow story. To fine-tune his content, he regularly asks us for feedback. Egbert is always easy to find and very approachable. He cares deeply about our well-being and often tells us to relax. He is open to answer even the weirdest questions and dedicates extra time to explain what's really important. Christine thinks with us instead of for us. She always finds creative examples that speak to us personally. We all know her from playing the flute to explain acoustic theories. The way she lights up when she talks about her passion creates a positive and happy environment for learning about climate design. Zullen we dit maar weggeven? We have a little thing. Wow. Well, at first, of course, I want to thank my students for, for yeah, letting me know 
that I'm their queen. That's what, what they told me. Um, yeah, I want to thank everyone. I, don't, I just don't know what to say, so uh, let's keep it with that. So. Thanks, everyone. Well, great. Congratulations. I think my faculty will be very pleased as well. I think it's the first time they won this. So. Well, congratulations, Christine. Uh, congratulations to all the other lecturers, of course. Uh, yeah, and then I'll give the word back to Rolf. Thanks, Robert. Also from my side, many congrats, uh, Christine, and the same apply to the, uh, the other uh, nominated lecturers. Next on our uh, uh, scheme is um, the Education Team Award. That is new. We haven't done that before. Um, and uh, we like to do that because more and more we see that education, educational development is teamwork. Um, the complexity of what we do, the things that need to be accomplished, um, requires that more and more people literally team up also in, the, in our education and education programs. And to highlight that and the achievements that we have, we also have an award for um, the teams. What we did is we asked for, uh, again, all faculty to uh, nominate the team. So we had eight. The jury uh, read all the applications and, uh, and, and the, the stories about them, um, had a discussion, and we ended it up with three teams that more or less were a little bit sticking out over, over the rest. So that is um, the nanobiology team, the computer science team, and the um, prime mathematics team. Um, the team leads of those teams should be here in the room. Could they stand up and be applauded? <laughs> You can sit down again, thanks. Um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a box for those in the back who couldn't see it of uh, the, uh, the chocolate, uh, the Tony, what is it called? Tony Hupplepup. I never get to read that at home because then my wife already finished the Tony <laughs> Chocoloni chocolate. Uh, so um, I hope you can share it with your team, but that depends on how you have organized your team, whether you will eat everything or that you share. It's up to the team, of course. I have no say in that. Um, but again, out of these three, we can nominate only one that is, again, slightly better, if you want to frame it that way, than the others. So let's take a look. The Corona Research Super Project developed an interdisciplinary project where students with different backgrounds could do research about the COVID-19 pandemic. Its success led to creating a new nanobiology transdisciplinary minor based on similar goals of innovative research education. Our team consists of teachers, students and educational specialists from the TU Delft and Erasmus who worked on the conjoined projects. One thing that stands out is everyone really listens to each other and builds on each other's ideas. A great example of education convergence between the TU Delft, Erasmus University and Medical Center. We are a computer science and engineering teaching team. We were founded five years ago to survive the tsunami year of 863 first year computer science students. What is special about our team is that after surviving our tsunami year, we were able to bring a lot more quality to our courses and teaching in general. Well, we're really proud that we can not only work within the team, but we can also work with all the teachers within the department. We are prime. Our goal is to improve mathematics education across faculties. 
Now, one of the nice things about Prime is that everything we make and do is a result of a collaboration between lecturers, researchers and students. Prime develops lecture materials that teachers can use in class, but we also make tools for students that help them to better understand the link between math and engineering. There needs to be team effort. Okay, join. To the team or the team lead, the important question, what gaat er nu door je heen? <laughs> um, well, I'm very proud, of course. So this is a really, really large operation, the entire prime operation. It's more than 30 lecturers. We have educational researchers, coordinators, students. So um, this is really a big honor for us. Thank you. Same question. Yes, yeah, wonderful. <laughs> and it's really, it, the team is so much fun. So it's, it's, uh, it's really, this was just uh, actually, uh, there, were, there are so many more in our team. They were not in here, but we have to celebrate together. And we, uh, all the lecturers should, which, help, which helps us. We can skip those. No, absolutely. It, it's great. Have a very important. It was so much fun. Yeah. Teaching, educating, working with students is so much fun. That's what we celebrate here. One round of applause for the Prime Team. Thanks very much. <laughs> All right, Anushka, your turn. All right, well, congratulations to all you and you and you and the teams. So uh, now we're um, at our Educational Fellow um, Grant Awards. And uh, so this is a program that started in 2016. That's even one year before we built uh, our teaching lab, which started in 2017. And um, so usually, we uh, select about four education fellows per year who then are working uh, on an innovation project uh, for two years and they, they get quite some money to work on this. And so they work on the project for, for two years, but you are an education fellow for your life as one of the education fellows um, said to us and I agree. It becomes a larger and larger community of people who are really believing in uh, improving our education by um, innovating and sharing and forming a, a, a really a warm community. Um, this year, we had more than 10 applications. So it was a really tough <laughs> and long uh, discussion who to award the grants to. Uh, last year, we selected only three, maybe also because of the COVID. Um, this time, we had more than 10 really all very nice, innovative projects. So I hope the people that are not awarded the grant still uh, are very motivated to continue their good work. But this time, this year, we have five. So we awarded five uh, education fellowships. Um, let me see if I can already announce them. Can I? Yes. Oh, great. Okay. So, Ilke, who is bridging the gaps in electrical engineering. Congratulations. Axel Vier from Aerospace Engineering. Freek Pols from TNW. Congratulations. Uh, 
Yeah, congratulations. Stefan Persol. <laughs> and Maurits Ersen, intern multidisciplinary. So congratulations to all and um, all be invited to our uh, lunch lectures at the Teaching uh, Lab and Teaching Academy where you will certainly hear about their progress but also of the progress of other education fellows. Um, and uh, yeah, <laughs> smile. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Let's applaud again. Okay, now there's more awards. I'm not going to um, the people ask the people to come up here, but we'll show you some. So we have uh, a professor of excellence. Uh, is it going to be show up or there he is? Right, Kees Fuik, which is a this is a, a reward from the uh, university board as well. Um, then there is a Comunius Fellowship being awarded to Nelson Mota. Uh, the Surf Open and Online Education Grant has been assigned to Sender Asut. Rolf Hutt also had an uh, Open Online Education Award. And uh, what Eduardo Van Zes won the, the Henk Decker Award. Henk, it should be Henk. Henk Decker Award uh, <laughs> from the LDE cell. So let's applause them as well. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. So Congratulations to all of you. And now let's continue. I think, Rob, the floor is yours again. Thanks, Anushka. Welcome. I don't want to build up the pressure, but we have high expectations of you. <laughs> and of course, to all of you, the meet and eats will be organized by the Teaching Academy, where these colleagues, at some point, will come and tell what they do and hopefully inspire you so that we can all pick it up and move forward with our education and enjoy that while having a meet and eat. Right, having said so, final part of our uh, afternoon is one more keynote lecture by David Abink, one of our colleagues here, who's going to talk about shaping the future of work. Um, and as I already mentioned in my opening, um, Connection is key. Connecting to us as colleagues, connecting to our students, but connecting also to future and society, and connecting across borders of our disciplines. And that is um, where, where David comes in. Um, he is full professor of haptic human robot interaction at the faculty of 3ME. And he is also the scientific director of FRAME, who probably will address that. Um, the Transdisciplinary Research Center on Shaping the Future of Physical Work. Um, so it's my privilege to present to you David Abing. David, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rob. And uh, thank you for taking uh, the time to listen to me. Uh, it's an honor to be uh, speaking on this education day. And so I hope I can share something about, uh, is this okay? Yeah. Yes, okay. I hope I can uh, explain you um, how I think about research that I'm doing and how that connects to education. And so a lot of work that I do is around uh, creating robotic solutions for the future of physical work. Nice engineering challenge. Uh, and what does that mean? Uh, these are kind of robots that we make in labs, and these are robots that, uh, that actually already work in, the, um, in our uh, yeah, workplaces. And they are uh, different kind of robots than, than you, you typically think of. And why is that? Because uh, this is the next generation of robotics. Cognitive robots. So that's robots that learn, just like uh, students can learn. And that maybe we can learn from again. Yeah? Uh, and they will hit the work floor. And uh, just to clarify, you know, that's uh, on the one hand, uh, hey, something's leaving. So, but that's on one hand, um, yes, thank you. The convergence, you could say, of artificial intelligence and of uh, traditional robotics research that needed to work in a place which was fully standardized. 
uh, and that will hit some points, will hit uh, the, the workflow, and our question is how do we make sure that that works well? So as an engineer, that's very interesting, but very important to understand is these kind of robots. Uh, uh, many people think about autonomy as the final goal. Now, I will tell you this, autonomy is not the final goal. It's not for robots, it's also not for uh, kids that we raise. Eh? We don't want them to be just autonomous. And uh, why do I talk about zebras? Well, uh, hopefully you'll understand after this little story. Zebras, um, they were used by Baron Rothschild. Yeah? Already done a very wealthy man about a century ago. By that time, everybody had horses. It was so blasé, you know, everybody could afford horses. If you really wanted to show you got money, you know, you import some zebra. They're basically like horses, but they have a different carrosserie. Yeah, so, uh, but you will never see pictures of these zebras actually walking because zebras refuse to be trained. Yeah. So they're autonomous, all right. Beautiful piece of engineering, yeah, but uh, they are, are very independent to the extent that well, they are not interdependent. They don't work with us. And so that's very different than horses. So this is a metaphor by one of my colleagues, Frank Flemish, who says, when we think about, for example, automated driving, we should think about the interaction between a driver and a horse. So that means the systems we make need to be cooperative and interdependent. Um, so uh, this is just to show that uh, this is very complex. These are all the design options you can think of, and there's probably many more about uh, how uh, you know, humans do cognition, motion control, perception, action, and how robots could do that too. And there's all sorts of different ways you can connect these to each other. Uh, so if you can forget about this, but uh, just to show you, uh, this is difficult stuff, difficult engineering stuff, a lot of to, to teach to our students. So as a good engineer, I ask myself, what's the problem? Why am I here? So this is the problem. Societal needs, the world needs to do more work with less, uh, less people, less energy, less money, less material, less time. So scarcity, demographics, et cetera, et cetera. And a recent challenge you've heard about is attracting workers. Yeah. Um, and so here's the idea. Can't we use robotics and AI as a solution? Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah, so potential gains, increased competitiveness and productivity, but yeah, some people are also concerned about loss of jobs, um, loss of dignity, social unrest, difficult stuff you can not really quantify, uh, unsustainable growth and increased inequality, these kind of things. Um, and so this is pictures you will see in the news, uh, the Amazon workers that uh, say, we are not robots, uh, the whole processes are, have been optimized for speed and productivity, but I have to wear diapers. Yeah, so uh, they uh, start to uh, come together, yeah? um, and, uh, and so uh, you could say we forget about the workers. Yeah? So uh, we need to attract and retain skilled personnel. Robots are not going to solve things for us. The big transitions of the future are not going to be done by robots. They're not going to be some superhuman, and we need to involve workers. Yeah? So just to clarify, uh, this is a very simplifi simplified version of the field, uh, but so what are we talking about when we're talking about robots? On one hand, we often think about cognitive tasks. We think about physical tasks. So cognition typically is the field of AI. Physical stuff, typically the field of robotics. And you could think of uh, automation, technology that replaces human, and augmentation. And in the press, they are, they are used interchangeably. Yeah, but they are all very different, and they need to be engineered very differently. Um, and so what do economists say, for example, when they talk about the future of work? They say, well, you know, it's kind of lazy to do this replacement. Why is it lazy? Because uh, actually it's the easy way to try and replace human activity. And then you can't replace it completely. You get rest work, and that rest work is really annoying. And for that, you, uh, you yeah, let it be solved by humans again, and then uh, they don't like it, and that means you need to automate more. And so he says, Actually, this ambition of replacement, that's killing. There's also lots of other research that says, you know, this automating, so replacing humans, that costs job. Don't do that. You need to augment workers. That's the most, that's the, that's the best way to keep jobs. Yeah, that has been at least so for the last 60 years. So that's what we should do. So it means, you know, new technology should be the solution for worker empowerment. And yeah, we need to empower our workers. That means we need to create human-friendly robotics that somehow boost productivity to meet societal challenges. And that's very important to teach to our students. And yeah, that means we need to think about these kind of links between humans and robots. And of course, we need to understand the context in which these work, but, uh, uh, but, but we need to provide the technology. And so then, for example, could work like this, and uh, these kind of robots that uh, saw, it could be nice in a 
construction work or perhaps, uh, I don't know, medical domain for amputations. I'm not quite sure, but it's pretty, pretty cool technology. And uh, what about impact and innovation? Okay, we need to realize real world impact, right? With our students. So, uh, well, don't worry. You know, this is me in a, in a car for Renault, and, and we, we actually work with companies, for example, to create, you know, mutually interacting interfaces. And uh, I do lots of uh, public outreach, and, uh, and I also try to uh, influence policymakers to think more clearly. Yeah? So this is what I try to teach to my students. So um, just checking, thermometer, are you convinced this is the way forward? You, you can raise your hand if you think this is the right way. And you can uh, and now raise your hand if you think uh, no. And if you think I'm being tricked, you can uh, raise your hand right now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, Chantal is trying to uh, call us. Uh, Chantal, I'm I'm busy. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so um, let's see if I can you give me control back again after declining my call. Yes. Ah, okay, so is this all we should uh, teach our students, these kind of things? Very important, impact, innovation, uh, you know, putting the worker first. No? Yes? No? Do you have any idea what, I, what I'm... <laughs> no? Okay, okay, good. So uh, I'm going to try and do this again. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Um, actually, I found out while I was pursuing this, I was not really doing what I was saying. So I want to talk about not creating robotic solutions for problems. I want to talk about how we shape the future of work with and for the people that are affected by the technology that we're creating. It means we still have the same robots and we have the same uh, situation. But uh, let's start and acknowledge that the future of work, quote unquote, which sounds very nice, is a complex or sometimes called wicked problem. What are wicked problems? Wicked problems are unstructured, so they're far from certainty on what you need to have, and there's not so much agreement how you should approach it, there's not enough knowledge. Uh, and then you can see all sorts of uh, things here about wicked problems which make them very difficult to solve. Well, that's difficult, um, I thought, yeah? So probably uh, I need to just do the best I can do and other people pick it up. Yeah, so what does it mean for my field? For example, yeah, so this is us on our side, uh, the robotics and HRI community, human robot interaction. Yeah, we make great stuff, uh, these kind of solutions, and um, yeah, we study how robots learn and adapt. And workers, yeah, well, you know, that's not really our field, of course. So, so let's hope that, that uh, social scientists will do that somehow. Yeah, but we'll develop the technology for them. Yeah? And uh, we test that in abstract lab context and uh, short-term interactions. Now, on the other hand of the corner, weighing over, no, okay. But so that means that social sciences, and they study how workers learn and adapt, uh, while robots do not. So they are not the kind of cognitive robots that are about to hit the, the market. So they study uh, how people craft work processes, uh, think about organizational change, but they only do that with commercially available technologies that are not these cognitive prototypes that we're making. Now, that means that on this end, we're making great prototypes. Sometimes we're lucky. These great prototypes turn into patents that I put on my resume. And then sometimes, together with companies, they might actually you know, get to, to the market. And then they'll get uh, the market implemented, and then maybe some social scientists will study it. And then maybe I will read the report. Not, sorry, no time, too busy. And what are they talking about with their qualitative research methods? Uh, uh, the qualitative researchers are laughing. Yeah? So qualitative research is, of course, by definition, <laughs> nonsense. Right? You are an engineer. If you cannot measure it, it's not true. Uh, a, t a couple of years ago, I would laugh too, but I, I have a bit of cringe um, because I really thought like that. Yeah, so my default, and which is typically epidemic response to this, is schoenmaker blijf bij je leest. I was trained engineer, I'm a very good engineer, I got all sorts of rewards, awards, good, well-cited publications, 
I'm an engineer, trust me, I know what I'm doing. Social scientists, I don't know, you know. They probably do good stuff too, they also get awards, I guess. Yeah, but uh, so somebody, sh yeah, but not me, because schoenmaker blijft bij je leest. It means stick to what you're good at. Don't become a jack of all trades, master of none, specialize. So, now I learned something about the downsides of that from my colleague uh, Mika, she's here in the room. And uh, she made me realize that if you want to address complexity, uh, this requires something called transdisciplinarity. What does it mean, transdisciplinarity? Anybody? Exactly, depends on who you ask. Yeah. So that's why I ask Mika, and then I just follow what she says. No, this is not quite true. But so I used to think uh, uh, transdisciplinary, that must be even cooler than interdisciplinary, because I heard that a couple of times, and then I heard transdisciplinary, so probably that's the next big thing or something. And it must be even cooler. Um, and interdisciplinary, that was actually the same as multidisciplinary. So actually, I'm a very multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary, or whatever you want to call it, researcher, because my work in human robot ingestion combines something of psychology and something of neuroscience and, of course, some engineering and control uh, engineering. So I am already a multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary, whatever you want it. Now, I learned that actually it's wise to make a decision, uh, a distinction between multidisciplinary work as meaning I work in my silo, somebody else works, works in a different silo, and we do that together in a project that somebody hopefully a very competent project leader, will integrate. If that hopefully competent project leader doesn't integrate it, hopefully somebody in society will. But at least I got my nice publications out of it. Guilty? Anybody else? No? Okay, so I'm the, luckily I'm the only scientist that worked like that. <laughs> so in that case, maybe you can already go for your drinks, because this is going to be a little bit of a personal story about how I realized how a lot of the work I was doing was not really connecting to, uh, to society, despite me thinking like that. Anyways, so interdisciplinary means that you actually need to work together and understand each other's languages. That means that you need to do part of the integration, academic, academic disciplines. Now that's hard work. It's slow, it's not particularly efficient. Prime example of where I learned that was in the AI tech consortium multi-faculty initiative at TU Delft. Some of my colleagues are in the, in, the, in the room as well. It was two years to write one paper. Not very good, right? But we learned a lot about each other's disciplines and kind of respecting each other's discipline and understanding what we could add on top of each other. Now, now then I ask you, what is transdisciplinary again? That means the, oh, yes. Not necessarily. That could still be interdisciplinary. Transdisciplinary, the way at least I accept it and I agree, you know, whoever you ask, it could be different. But that when you also include, hold on to your seats, non-academic knowledge. <laughs> now, non-academic knowledge is knowledge that nobody really knows, but that's what academics call everything else. That's non-academic, yeah? Interesting. So it means any kind of other knowledge, like uh, real-world knowledge, <laughs> yeah, that uh, doesn't really adhere to the rigors of scientific inqu inquiry. Practitioners have lots of experience, which we kind of acknowledge, okay, but please, let's not talk to them. Oh, if I talk to them, I'll talk a little bit slower because I'm so smart that I need to talk slower to the people who haven't had the privilege of going to a university. Of course, I'm exaggerating, but there's a little bit of me that does that. Yeah? So that's hard if you want to integrate all those things. And that's actually what you need to do if you really want to address uh, complex problems. Now, why is that? Why can't we just solve it from the engineering way? Um, Maybe, maybe very quickly, this is also, I think, an important element of transdisciplinary. Yeah, so there's two main views that in my mind are integrated. 
Yeah, um, and that means uh, one level, one idea of transdisciplinary means uh, it needs to be multi-level and multi-purpose. And it means we need to have empirical and pragmatic sciences and normative sciences and values. That's what we need to connect to create something new, eh, like one of my colleagues said. And another element is, no, no, what transdisciplinary means, it means you need to participate. So it's co-design, it's co-creation, it's uh, going to neighborhoods, uh, it's connecting with the real world, it's involving citizens, citizen science perhaps. That's what's trendy. Eh? And so I'm not here to argue definitions about this, but something in connecting across these levels of empirical and pragmatic sciences that already is very difficult for me, has proven to be very difficult for me. Because as an engineer, as a male engineer, I am trained to think about solutions and problems. And I will cut out a problem to fit my solution, and I'll write a nice story about it, and done. Anybody recognize it? Maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's just me, it could be. Yeah, well, and... Um, I, a transdisciplinary perspective means that you acknowledge complexity and that you, you are open to allow for evolution. All my European projects, milestones, deliverables, in month three I will do this and this, in month six I will have reached this and this. It's the only way to do it then. Open, evolution, no, that's too vague. Yeah, so please no room. And it needs some kind of vision that gives direction and doesn't and acknowledges that probably, you know, you may not reach something very concrete at the end of four years, but it's a, it's a compass. And the outcome spaces are not necessarily, uh, you know, all sorts of papers. They might be, that might be knowledge, but they might also be change in situations or learnings or relationships. So something very different than what we typically focus on in education, in science, uh, etc. So anyways, this integrating knowledge has proven to be hard work for me. Yeah, uh, it requires space to do this, time, uh, reflection, respect for other types of knowledge. Uh, and so that requires real dedication, I think. Now, it took me 20 years to reach to, uh, to the point out of my tunnel of productivity where I reached full professorship. <laughs> Yeah, and to actually start to be interested about in, in, in connecting other disciplines. For me, that's pretty long, and I hope I can bring something to my students that they perhaps could integrate that earlier. Anyways, it requires dedication, and so to just show you how much I really dedicated myself to acquiring um, you know, the time and the effort to, to um, delve into social sciences, I married an anthropologist. Yeah, so uh, this is a nice picture, uh, but there has been many, 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 many fights yeah, uh, between us. And it took her a lot of patience to get me out of my, uh, yes, but, uh, sorry, but what do you mean uh, experience? What do you mean uh, participatory observation? What do you mean qualitative science? What, 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 sorry, but how is that statistically true? How do you how do you you know dissect meaning from nonsense? Is anything okay then? You know, just ask people. Anyways, uh, thank you, Frederik. <laughs> so the real problem, I think, is a disconnect, a disconnect that we have in our society. A disconnect between, in, our, in the case of this topic, workers, organizations, tech developers, scientists the top, the bottom. We don't talk that much. We don't spend time to understand each other's places, experiences. Uh, and if we look at work processes, we need to understand that there's actual workers, not these kind of toy puppets, but people with history and wishes and dreams. And these organizations have a life and a history of their own. And the robots, ladies and gentlemen, they're not gonna magically solve anything. They're going to be integrated in this whole complex system. And actually, it's like an experiment. It's a social experiment to, do, to put a robot in a workplace. Except, as engineers, we typically are not interested in the outcome of that experiment. So I'd like to be interested in that. 
Yeah? And that means that uh, I need to understand the different questions. Yeah? So companies ask, they come to me, how can I be competitive? How can I be a better employer? How do I attract and retain our workforce? What commercial robots can I use, David? How can I use robotics research? Yeah, but the workers, if you go actually and, and spend some time and talk with them, then they ask very different questions. Is this uh, organization good enough? Why are they bringing in a roboticist? Are they going to take away my job? Are they, what, what, what does this person care? Flies in and out. They ask different questions. Do I earn enough? Is my work satisfying? You know, will robots affect my work positively or negatively? And the scientists might ask, uh, well, uh, focus on which work processes. That's what we're interested in. Tell me a good to use case. Yeah. Oh, actually, we have a nice uh, hammer here. Uh, where's the nail? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, that's the one that we can do. So, together with Joost, uh, a colleague of mine uh, involved in frame, think about strategy. Actually, we might reframe what we're doing and say, we're not uh, solving a problem. We're doing that all right. Of course, we're making you know, the best technology that we can make with the right direction and the right intention. But actually, this technology that we develop with companies, with the workers, for the workers, together, uh, that means uh, it's actually an insight generator for systemic change. What makes work actually interesting for them? And if we take away chunks and bits and pieces, and if we replace them and augment them, what changes? That means a uh, long-term engagement we need to have yeah, to uh, understand that. And that means rigid social science work. Uh, and so that's what we're trying to do. Um, I have five more minutes, right? I think. Not? Yeah? Oh, no, okay. So uh, this is uh, our work for a project called Bright Sky. So this is at KLM. KLM came to us and said, well, David, um, these kind of uh, engines, they need to be resurfaced. What we hope to do is that we can repair more of them. Not right now we chuck away quite a bit. The more we can repair, yeah, the better it is for our business. Uh, also, it's better for... Uh, for sustainability, of course, and so there's all sorts of good reason. And we're kind of worried with our workforce uh, because they're quite old and they have lots of uh, expertise. Can't you just uh, capture that with AI? And then uh, that means that uh, when they're gone in 10 years, then we can still do business. I said, no, 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 no you can't do that. Yeah, it's, um, even if it would be possible, it's probably not what you want, but you know, that's. It's a myth. You cannot just copy, copy skills from people and put it in an algorithm. But with robots then, yeah, physical work, can, can we do some robots? Uh, if you want to do something with robots, it needs to be assistance. Ah, yeah, okay, okay. And after a while of talking, I said, well, the only way I want to do work with you is if I can do this in a transdisciplinary way. So that means I want to go with these kind of teams to your organization. So this is Ladies and gentlemen, a roboticist, a design student, me, uh, a psychologist, a postdoc in uh, robot learning, PhD student in robotics, uh, a design lead at RoboHouse, and two employees at KLM. And together we go visit a couple of the work processes. And everybody sees something different. Our roboticists see, hey, look, 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 you know, we have our hammers, you know, that's the nails that we can do actually do something with. The psychologists say, hey, this is interesting. You know, why, why uh, are we focusing on these work processes? Actually, I'm curious to find out what the, the whole work process over the week are that people you know, uh, get engagement from. Because if you know that, then at least you will not roboticize or change the parts that people really get meaning from. Uh, but how do you do that? So they bring their own methodologies. The ethnographers, the anthropologists, they do something different. They say, well, why is that person not saying anything? Why is that person taking all the attention? What is not being said? Anyways, all these different perspectives, we don't brought together, and we start to get a deeper understanding as opposed to a kind of more superficial understanding. So that means uh, transdisciplinarity for me is learning how to overcome disconnect. Learning how to overcome disconnect between scientific disciplines, disconnect between the management and the workers, between me and people that I have no way of connecting to, actually, well, if you spend some time, you might be surprised. Um, 
So, but we're engineers too, right? So this is not a, let's change the world, da, da, da. No, actually, this is, this is what we then do. So we created portable robot-assisted work processes. And so here you see one of those fan blades that need to be repaired with a robot arm uh, that uh, lightens the load uh, for people to do uh, the, the kind of manipulations they need to do. And because it's portable, we tested it and took it to Lowlands. Uh, if you can survive a drunk audience, you know, you can safely take it to a workplace. Um, and then uh, all of a sudden, this is what and, uh, robots on the work floor actually mean. This is a scientist from Eindhoven and one of the PhD students um, that we uh, supervise, getting a, f a real experience as opposed to reading papers about what this robot assistance might mean. And then we actually went, you know, with different teams to visit KLM and to shadow the workers and understand the skill, slowly start to appreciate the skill of what it is that they do. So this is them uh, working real hard physical work. These people are trainees. The guy who's expert in it, he ruined his shoulder because the work is so incredibly tough that he knows now how to do it, but he can't physically do it anymore. Yeah, and so we started to understand, well, maybe we need to use these kind of robot arms that could take away some of the force while still allowing, you know, uh, these people to, uh, to work and use their, you know, what they're skilled at instead of taking that away. Um, and then, uh, 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 we had that already. So this is how we then went. The second time, we took, oh, well, sorry, one of these robot prototypes on the work floor, spent the day with these people, and co-created some of the assistance that we never thought of ourselves. Now, these are the people that I then involved and have been involving for two years already for a gravitation grant. So that's a very large fundamental science grant, 10 years. 25 million euros, all sorts of different disciplines. We you see ethnographers, qualitative social science, quantitative social science, robot learning, physical human robot interaction, social human robot interaction. There's designers involved in all the three technical universities, philosophers, just to make sure we have as many disciplines and as many perspectives at the table to actually learn from each other. And that means we're not solving our own problems anymore and we're not thinking about our own papers. We're actually spending time to, yeah, to, to create a different way of doing engineering. So it's almost like a field level change of engineering to get s sufficient hands and feet, sufficient grounding of what transdisciplinary methods might actually mean. And these are just, this is just us trying. Yeah, so I, I'm not saying uh, this is also not ready embedded in courses to teach but we're making small steps. So we hope to, uh, to put this together in a, in a building, a building of frame, where you can have physical spaces where we could do these kind of work processes um, and, and transdisciplinary research integration. Now, are, isn't there not initiatives already running? Yes, sure there are. I've heard of some today that I didn't know of. Uh, at AI Tech, we created some uh, small uh, courses already, two days. Um, at AI Tech, we have many interdisciplinary lectures, not so much transdisciplinary yet. And there's many initiatives around bachelor and master science education, where we take people, take some time to reflect, to go into discussion with each other. Um, and one example of that, there's many, but is the work uh, that I do together with, uh, with uh, Plön around reflective engineering at Plön Hermsen, um, uh, which, uh, which means that uh, we take time to think, think things through and question each other and not say too easily, uh, you know, uh, uh, but basically to be able to, to give each other good, uh, good feedback and, uh, and, and have deep learning. So um, that means it requires different skills. Uh, and I think for me, the future of education that I want to work on is really taking this time to connect to connect scientific disciplines, to connect to society, and do the hard work instead of just saying it. Um, so there you go. That's my uh, s something of my journey. And um, if there's any questions, I'll be happy to go and connect with you around that. Talk? Ah, yes, thanks. Questions <laughs> from 
remarks. Yes. I can do it in my left hand. <laughs> Thank you for the very interesting uh, presentation. And I'm uh, really curious, how do the, so the workers react on the, the arm of the robot? Mm -hmm. Because you showed us the picture, yes. and they stood a bit looking at it. <laughs> yes. So I'm clearly curious. <laughs> There's so much to say around that, but it was fascinating. So we had many assumptions, right? Our first assumption was, uh, it's like an experiment. So we come and we build up the robot, and then when we're ready, then we can uh, have, uh, have them experience it, but one by one, and we had all sorts of ideas of how to manage that. Yeah, but of course, the experiment started as, <laughs> as soon as we went in with the robot. And people were oh, curious, hey, well, what's happening here? And they started asking questions while we were building it up. Yeah. Um, the first workers were interested, but as soon as it was powered, they thought, well, hmm. Yeah, and so you saw somebody, uh, so we, we, we touched it and showed, you know, yeah, it's. Basically, it's like a, a spring with many links uh, that we can manipulate. Uh, don't worry, it's not going to hit you or something. Uh, and so they, uh, the first person grasped it, and, and, and then he said, hey, hey, John, uh, come here. And uh, he said, no, oh, it's, oh, no, I'm left-handed. It won't work with me. And then we said, yeah, yeah, sure thing. You can, it flips around, yeah, so, uh, so do it. And oh, hey, and look, we've made this nice tool for you. So because this is what it would work. No, 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 no. No, come, come, come. Hey, Jack, 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 yeah, okay, up, they put their tool. Can you change the tool? So all sorts of uh, emergent uh, activities uh, bubbled up that we never anticipated on. And uh, I think the, the we learned also, we took it to their workplace and we first spent an hour or two trying to understand with that team how they normally worked before we showed our tools. So it was kind of like show and tell. You know, you show your, your tools, we show our tools. And then we tried the same with another group that worked somewhere else. That didn't work. <laughs> yeah, so they came and they didn't want to touch it. And, and then we thought, yeah, we didn't spend the time to actually <laughs> be interested. It was just like, hey, come, uh, you know, what would you think? And then people don't engage. If this translates, you know, if this is true knowledge, statistics, N is one, yeah? but I think we learned a lot about the power of making connections before we come up with quote-unquote solutions. And also the fun of, the, of doing it together. We just, we laughed a lot. And uh, so, yeah, there's some impressions. Yeah, long answer. Other questions, remarks? Yes, behind you. Thank you much for your very enthusiastic talk. <laughs> I was wondering for me, as a starting career in this university, um, how could I convince my bigger bosses in the department that connecting in this deep level and taking these kind of educational initiatives makes sense, whereas I have no idea if this is actually going to score papers or whatever. Yes, uh, I can give them a call. <laughs> No, <laughs> but um, uh, seriously though, I think uh, if you, if somebody would have come to me five years ago, I said, uh, just, you know, be smart, be smart about it, you know? It's also a game. Academia is a bit of a game, right? And so you have to know how to score quickly. So don't take, don't spend too much time. I think now I would say it differently. I say it's really valuable to have deep roots do, so I'm not saying everybody should throw away the disciplines and we should all be nice and transdisciplinary together. That's not going to work. So you need to kind of earn your street credit <laughs> yeah, to, to, uh, to, to have deep, uh, deep roots. At the same time, it really doesn't hurt and it can actually inspire science if you spend some time you know, uh, uh, exploring uh, connections broader. And so that is something you could convince them with, I think. Yeah, they're saying, well, I want to spend, I don't know, the first year, 20% of my time, or you know, at some point, or I see an opportunity coming, and, and I just want to spend a couple of months, one day a week. Or you could come to the AI tech lectures, or you could come you know, to connect with other people who are undoubtedly here who work on similar initiatives. There's uh, Wij Stad uh, that goes out into uh, Delft. There's, there's, ma and there's probably many more things that I don't even know of. So maybe uh, just uh, stand up and wave, and then the people who have something uh, to help her with, uh, you, you could be helped, uh, hopefully. Yeah? But um, go for it.
Yes. Provocative question. How do you get social scientists to train your students? Huh. <laughs> We're not there yet. So, so it's, a, it's a good question. So in Delft, it's easier. But as you saw, I connect also other universities. So, so actually, things really start moving when there's money. Yeah? And then people uh, have a reason to spend time. So far, I'm running, in a way, on fumes, yeah? on goodwill of people, on interest, on, uh, on enthusiasm. That interest, for me, and that enthusiasm will take us, at some point, to a, to a grant. I'm, I'm, I'm sure, you know, and we'll knock on the glass until it breaks. But I think at, at that moment, there will be real intensity of training. Now, so far, as, as I mentioned, it's based on enthusiasm. So my students are involved in, you know, in these kind of visits, uh, workshops, discussions. They're quite intense. We meet maybe every you know, two weeks for something that's long or short. And that's where it happens. So that's so far as, as we've done it. I've got all sorts of plans about how to do that when there's you know, a bit of structural money so you can set it up well. Um, but that's mainly for all the drinks. Yeah. Any more? Yes? Ah, so now's the challenge to throw it to yeah. the front row there. All right. <laughs> Via. I have a big issue with balance, so don't throw stuff at me. Uh, but I have to ask a question given what I'm doing as a teaching uh, fellow, right? I'm talking about interdisciplinarity and stuff, so I, sorry, I have to ask. Um, it's okay. To what extent do you use the experience you have on integration between scientists and, and non-scientists, as in creating knowledge and stuff, in didactic ways with your students? There's no, there's no reason to assume that your way of learning, and including the anarchy and the not working as designs, works in educational settings as well, right? Yep. Have you been able to translate it already into didactics? No. So well, we should talk. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, think, uh, I think we should. So there's elements of it, and I've done elements of te teaching, and I think one of the elements I've tried is to uh, really get people to be honest and dare to ask questions and be really interested in each other. And that's something I've, uh, I do in courses that I've taught for 10 years or 15 years, where I know I can do it, where I, c I can create the atmosphere where people, at some point I don't need to do it anymore. You know, you step away. Uh, and so it's, uh, I, it's getting some critical mass in, I would have honest conversations, you know, and honest in interest. And so in that sense, I feel I have some, uh, didactic uh, principles by which I do that. But the, the, uh, all of this that we're now doing, you know, the last couple of months, I haven't uh, put in this. So please, yes, I would love to, uh, to have a chat around that. Yeah. I have to do something in the next two years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> True. Good. Hi, thank you for your uh, fascinating uh, talk and your journey. So my question is a little bit, so I'm confused listening to this story and contrasting it with how success is measured in academia, which is publishing papers, being very, very specialized in one topic. Sure, it gives you street cred, which is the answer to what you uh, told the, uh, mm -hmm. the other lady there. Uh, but I'm wondering, isn't it, um, a catch-22 that you have to become specialized in one field to get uh, street credit and then you go to transdisciplinarity? How do you start early if yeah. you want to? Yeah, that's, uh, I think, a very good question. Um, it, uh, it actually uh, is about systemic change, right? So, if, so uh, where do you start to transform uh, something like Erkennen and Vaidea, right? So the, the, the recognition that, that, that people get really yeah, and so there's all sorts of initiatives already running for a while i would say that the only reason why i dared to do this was the moment when i became full professor only at that time for me it's very personal but for me did i finally feel okay i don't need to run anymore yeah and i was very much motivated by external uh, grants and awards and those kind of things Th so that was for me not everybody's like that 
But so I needed that. I needed that to then say, okay, well, you know, now I'm here. Uh, who, who, who can touch me, right? Something like that. And now I will do what I think uh, uh, I want to do. Oh, what is it that I want to do? Yeah? And I started to think, and this, is the, this has been many years, uh, three years or something, before it materialized to something that I think is concrete. It can produce really fascinating fundamental science. It can be, become really uh, applied innovation. It can uh, link to education. It took a long time. So your question, f for me, relates to some of the other questions. How do you get this institutionalized so that you don't have to do this for 20 years, <laughs> you know, before you can start to work like this? And, and so I think I see the seeds of it in many, of, um, many currently perhaps some disconnected projects. And so my sense is if, you know, maybe we start a little movement around this that, uh, that, that gains uh, some, uh, some momentum. Um, I think there's a lot to be gained, also to be learned from other universities. So there's people who, who engage in these kind of practices more. So for me, tr teaching us transdisciplinary methodologies, connecting, I think should be a, a very important part of you know the next uh, 10 years or so of education. Um, yep. Yes, uh, from my side, yes. Sorry, interest. Um, the, the, the power structure is clear, right? People can afford stuff when they are in certain positions and have certain genders and certain colors and stuff. Uh, so that's what we need to break through. What I think also helps is to shift the discussion in interdisciplinarity a little bit. So far it has been you are an engineer and you add something to it, right? And you're still... I like to think that if you are a social responsible engineer, you want to respond to societal questions, it's not adding on, your technical skills, skills need to increase. Mm -hmm. A good social engineer knows more mathematics. So it's, and that's a didactic issue for me. So I think that's, it doesn't solve the power issue at all. Yeah. But if we reframe the discussion as in you're not a, a real engineer, if you do add on, you're a better engineer, you should be a better engineer in s technical skills if you want to be societally responsible. I so that discourse change I think is important. Yeah. So that's, a, I think, a fascinating discussion. Personally, for me, I think I've become a better engineer because I know better what not to pursue. Yeah? So that, that's it for me. I don't think I learned much more mathematics uh, for me. But that's the issue. It's not happening yet. I th I, my claim is that it should happen. Ah, right, 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 right. Yeah. Well, I'll meet you at the bar. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That was a good closing remark, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you again, David, for your presentation. Thank you. Well, Rob, I think we are now at really at the end of this uh, yep. fascinating day and inspiring for me, at least. If you um, would summarize this day in one word or one sentence, what would you say? I would say that I was really happy to be able to celebrate education on campus with such a large group of colleagues. That is for me the most important thing of what we did today. All the discussions that we could have, all the examples that we, uh, that we went through, uh, it's two sentences, but that's my summary. How about the people in the audience? Where is the, where is the mic? Anybody wants to say something about this day? Share with us. Yeah, that will. We come. will. We will. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Maybe something. No. Okay, we will talk about it. I think at the drinks. For me, you know, I was thinking after seeing everything that happened and listening to all the talks and listening to all the discussion and see everybody connect. I thought, I mean, this theme of today, how can we ever get a better one? So, but I saw in yours, <laughs> the last slide, there's deep connection. So maybe <laughs> <laughs> last next year we should talk about deep connection. Um, yeah, uh, okay, right. So yes, thank you first of all, all of you and the people that are not here anymore for being here, contributing, um, making it to a big success, but I think now it's time for all the yellow t-shirts and <laughs> people in the yellow t-shirts to come here because without this team they have made such a nice 
organization, everything. Woo. Dank jullie wel. Dank je 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 wel. It's not only about knowledge. It's not only about organization, but it's also about atmosphere. It's about working together as a real team. I'm really proud of you and so happy to work with you together. So thank you again. And with that, I guess, Anushka, colleagues, yes. folks, it's time for the drinks. Thanks very much. <laughs>